Hey guys, welcome back to the garage. Our project to renovate this 1989 Saab turbo convertible moves into an important new phase. After many weeks of removing parts, it's finally time to start putting it all back together. In the last episode, we removed the cylinder head and discovered the head gasket replaced by another mechanic 17 years ago was holding up pretty well with no signs of a leak. I took the cylinder head to a professional who replaced the exhaust stud that I broke off removing the exhaust manifold. They also cleaned it up and confirmed it's square, no need to mill it. So while the head was away, I moved on to deal with the timing chain. There are two procedures for changing the timing chain. One is called the roll-in method, and that's the most popular and least expensive because you don't have to have the engine out of the car. Just you know, Google search that, you'll find how that process works. But since the engine is already out, we're going full Monty on this one. That means we're gonna change the timing chain and also the chain guides. To get to all of that, we first have to remove some of these components. Now let me orient you. This is the front of the engine. So it's against the firewall in our cars, remember, because our engines are in backwards. So this is up against the firewall. Here is your uh, water pump, and this is your oil pump. This is your crankshaft, the end of the crankshaft, and this is the oil pump area. And then all of this is the timing chain cover. Removing the oil pump is really pretty simple, series of bolts and then give it just a tug, it'll come loose. Be sure to replace the rubber O-ring before it goes back in. Okay, while I'm removing a couple more of these uh, timing chain cover bolts, let me just put something out there for discussion and see if uh, see what you guys think. So, you know, Saab is, people often talk about Saab's being, having aircraft influence design. And yeah, I get the wrap around windshield and uh, the, the positioning of the controls and the way the dash is laid out, but what are some other examples? What, what else in our cars do you think is influenced by that aircraft design? Now, there's a lot of good build quality that went into the car, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's aircraft influenced. It's kind of like to get your thinking on that. If you have some thoughts, if you have some suggestions, just uh, put them in the comments below. With all the bolts removed, it took a few love taps from a rubber mallet to coax my time and chain cover to come loose. Fortunately, I planned ahead and bought a new timing chain guide. It's a good thing, because mine was showing some wear and even had developed some small cracks. Well, now that I've had a good look at the uh, timing chain, I don't think this is original. I think it's very likely that when the head gasket was replaced by a shop in Ohio about 17 years ago, they also replaced the timing chain. But I didn't know that going in, so we have a new chain that we're gonna put in place just to be on the safe side. You know, timing chains are uh, coming back into style with auto manufacturers for a while. Everybody went to belts instead of chains. And uh, now they're coming back to chains. And, in large part, that's because chains are just more durable and last longer. Of course, that's always important, but even more so now. That's because modern engines often use variable valve timing systems to produce so much power, fuel economy, and yet low emissions. You know, in comparison, our engines are bone simple, but back in the day, this was quite a little powerhouse. It left the factory putting out about 165 horsepower. Not bad for a four-cylinder. I mean, consider that the BMW E30, the 325, with that sweet straight six-cylinder engine. Well, it was only putting out about 168 horsepower. So yes, Saab was competitive in the horsepower game. But here's something you may not know. Saab was also competitive on the racetrack. The Skip Barber Saab Pro Series used 30 of these turbocharged four-cylinder engines to power open wheel race cars. We watch, we wait, and now we see green and we are ready to go. Julian with the jump from the pole position. Let's see if he can hang on. Ashton Lewis in the red corner. 
Oh sure, they were modified with a race exhaust and some other changes to put out more like 225 horsepower, but still it was the same B202 engine. And I've read online that after 100,000 miles of racing, not a single one of those engines suffered a failure that required a teardown and a rebuild. It's pretty impressive. I'd like to believe it's true because I'd like to believe this is one tough little power plant.